Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be talking about Guillain-Barre syndrome. We'll talk about how this disease is first acquired by looking at the basic biochemical mechanism, and then we'll also talk about the clinical presentation of the disease. So Guillain-Barre syndrome is acquired. It is not a genetic condition. And the prerequisite for getting Guillain-Barre syndrome is an infection by some microorganism. For this example, we're going to use cytomegalovirus, but this is not the only microorganism that can eventually induce Guillain-Barre syndrome. There's a list of about five of the most common ones right here. Uh, cytomegalovirus is about 10% of Guillain-Barre cases. There's also a species of bacteria called Campylobacter jejuni. That's the majority, about 30% of cases. And then these latter three have been associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome, so the Epstein-Barr virus, Varicella zoster virus, and Mycoplasma pneumoniae. And so in this case, we're going to begin with infection by cytomegalovirus, and this is in theory what the virus actually looks like. Now, when you get infected by anything, really, there is an immune system response, right? And one of the key players in the adaptive immune response are the B lymphocytes, or B cells, right? And so whenever you have an active infection, these B cells start proliferating, and some of them differentiate into plasma cells. Plasma cells are specialized B cells that can now start actively secreting antibodies, and then those antibodies then go and tag whatever it is that you want to destroy. So the plasma cell will then start producing antibodies. So here's your antibody, right? So any cytomegaloviruses that are currently in the body, plus potentially any that might invade in the future, these antibodies bind those viruses or bacteria in some cases, as we saw a minute ago, and mark them for destruction. And that's the basis of the humoral immune system with antibodies, right? Now, in reality, this antibody is very, very small compared to these viruses right here. Okay? Uh, really, what the antibody is binding is an individual protein on the surface of the virus. And that protein in this context is an antigen. Remember, antibodies bind antigens. Okay? And what the antibody does is it looks for something that resembles that antigen. And so in theory, this antibody should only be able to bind antigens belonging to the cytomegalovirus. And in that way, the antibody is very specific. But what happens if there's a second antigen somewhere else that structurally resembles the proteins on the surface of the cytomegalovirus. Well, then the antibody might actually also bind to that antigen. And that's actually the basis of Guillain-Barre syndrome. So here is a neuron, which is part of a nerve. Okay? And on this neuron's axon, we of course have these myelin sheaths. Well, it turns out that there are proteins associated with these myelin sheaths that are structurally very similar to the antigen on the cytomegalovirus that this antibody binds. And so that means that the antibody will also be able to bind that protein associated with the myelin. And what does that mean? Well, the antibody is going to flag this myelin for destruction, and that's going to cause a huge problem for that neuron. Because if the myelin sheath starts getting attacked, well, then the myelin is going to be destroyed. Now you have exposed axon here. So that's going to do a couple of things. One, it's going to slow the rate of, of action potentials going across this axon, right? Because there's less myelin. But also there's going to be secondary damage to this axon and overall damage to the entire nerve. So again, in Guillain-Barre syndrome, it's acquired because you have a prerequisite infection by one of those aforementioned microorganisms. And their antigens look structurally similar to proteins associated with myelin of our neurons. And so when your immune system starts making these antibodies, they may potentially bind to proteins of the neuron and mark that neuron for destruction. And that's Guillain-Barre syndrome. 
Now, Guillain-Barre syndrome is different than these other three motor neuron diseases that we talked about in previous videos. So amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, post-polio syndrome, spinal muscular atrophy. These three conditions are motor neuron diseases. So there's not going to be any sensory changes with these three conditions because sensory neurons are not attacked, only motor neurons are attacked. So in Guillain-Barre syndrome, it's not just the motor neurons that are attacked, it's the entire peripheral nerve. And so what do peripheral nerves contain? Well, they contain both motor components and sensory components. So we're going to expect to see motor issues, and we are going to expect to see sensory changes, so paresthesias, neuropathic pain, things like that that we would not expect in any of these motor neuron diseases. Okay? So how does Guillain-Barre syndrome present? Well, first I'm going to jump all the way down here and say that the progression is extremely rapid. It does have the potential for recovery, but all these impairments that we're going to see come on pretty quick and progress very rapidly. So first of all, the sensory and motor loss pattern is in a distal to proximal fashion. So if you're talking about the lower extremities, the feet, intrinsic muscles of the feet are going to lose uh, their function first. You're going to lose sensation in your feet first. And then it's going to travel up to the ankle, the lower leg, the knee, and so on and so forth. And you can make the same argument for the upper extremity. It would begin in the fingers, then the hand, then the wrist, then the forearm. And it's going to progress upward toward the hip and shoulder girdles, respectively. And this type of loss pattern is what we term a stocking glove pattern, because remember, you put stockings and gloves on the distal parts of each extremity. And also, the loss pattern is symmetrical. So you're not going to have the loss in one leg and not the other, or one arm and not the other. You're going to have it in both legs and both arms. It's going to be symmetrical. And again, you're going to have a variety of motor and or sensory deficits because it's a peripheral nerve condition. Peripheral nerves contain both motor and sensory components. Now, does this affect the central nervous system? No, this does not affect the central nervous system. This is affecting peripheral nerves, which are part of the peripheral nervous system. So the neurological signs that we're going to see are going to be lower motor neuron signs. We'll get to that in a few minutes. As we've talked about, Guillain-Barre syndrome is acquired, meaning you have to have a prerequisite infection, and we'll see this in another video, but there are four or five, depending, variants of the disease, um, where in some you might lose more motor, in some it might be more sensory, in others it might be more balanced. Uh, the most common variant is this kind called acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. But regardless of which variant of Guillain-Barre syndrome you have, it's all going to follow the same pattern. You're going to have distal to proximal loss or stocking glove loss of motor and or sensory function. And because it's the peripheral nervous system, we're going to have loss of those Schwann cells, which are going to be the myelinating cells, and eventually that's going to lead to axon death. Now, what muscles are affected? Well, it doesn't target specific muscles. It just goes in that distal to proximal pattern. So if we're talking about the upper extremity, uh, probably the intrinsic muscles of the hand are going to be affected first. So the person may initially have weakened grip strength. Eventually, it'll go up to the forearm, and so the wrist flexors and extensors are going to become weaker. And then eventually, it'll go up to the brachium and then the shoulder girdle if it progresses up that far. So it doesn't target specific muscles. It just targets distal to proximal. And then the muscle tone impairment, the main thing we're going to see is hypotonia. Okay? Muscles become hypotonic. Uh, if you tested reflexes, you would probably also see they'd be hyporeflexic. So we're just looking at lower motor neuron signs. Now, with these peripheral nerve conditions like Guillain-Barre, the main difference that we're going to see over motor neuron diseases is that the motor neuron diseases don't have any sensory changes. You can still have pain, but it's going to be musculoskeletal pain or fatigue pain. Okay? Uh, you're not going to see paresthesias or anything like that, neurological changes. In Guillain-Barre syndrome, yes, we do have neurological changes in sensory function. Paresthesias, maybe allodynia, maybe, maybe hyperalgesia. So yes, there is uh, 
sensory changes and the pain that ex is experienced can be musculoskeletal, but it can also be neuropathic pain because now we have sensory neurons that are negatively affected. And as we talked about at the beginning of this slide, it has a rapid progression, but it does have potential for recovery. Hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of Guillain-Barre syndrome. In the next video, we're going to do a little bit with Charcot-Marie Tooth. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.